ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to lecture one. This is our introduction to psychology. I'm going to break this into three sections. The first section is going to talk about what psychology is and what it isn't. Uh, the second section will talk about all the different fields of psychology. We'll start with the philosophers who kind of uh, began thinking about uh, how our minds work and why we behave as we do. And then I'll go through the different fields there today. The last video is going to be brief, but it's an important one. Uh, this is a take-home lesson uh, of how you can use psychology in uh, essentially every aspect of your life that involves learning. Uh, more on that later. Let's talk psychology. Uh, in simple terms, psychology is really just uh, the scientific study of what's going on in our head uh, and, and why we behave the way that we do. All right. There's a broad distinction that I want to get uh, out of the way right up front. So there's two different types of psychologists. Uh, you have your research psychologists who are going to uh, study uh, either mental processes or behaviors in a laboratory setting. All right? their, their goal is to understand how our mind works, uh, why we behave a certain way, uh, and they'll do this with a variety of methods, which we'll talk about later. Uh, this gentleman uh, in this picture is wearing a multi-electrode array. Uh, he's, he's wearing a cap for what we call electroencephalography, uh, or EEG. So all those little electrodes are going to measure brain activity through his hair, through his scalp, through his skull. So it's, it's noisy, but believe it or not, you can record brain activity uh, with those surface electrodes. Not every psychologist uh, is a researcher. All right. Uh, some psychologists will take that research uh, generated by a research psychologist and use it to treat patients in the clinic, and those will be what we call psychologist practitioners. Uh, these are going to uh, be the people who who give psychological tests. Uh, you know, for example, to find out if a child uh, has ADHD or or dyslexia or something along those lines, and they may provide talk therapy uh, to help patients. They're, they're similar to psychiatrists, but they are distinct. So a research, uh, I'm sorry, a, a psychologist practitioner is going to have a PhD. They're going to be trained in research methods. A psychiatrist, uh, on the other hand, is going to have an MD. They're going to have medical training. And so this, this creates a pretty clear distinction where psychiatrists uh, can prescribe drugs. Typically, psychologists can't. Uh, and if they can, it's to a limited degree. So that's the broad distinction. So there's two, two main divisions in psychologists. Uh, no matter what research is important to them, uh, the research psychologists generate research and the psychologist practitioners use that research uh, to keep their, their therapies uh, up to date. Now, whenever psychologists are studying behavior, they're going to do so at multiple levels. Some psychologists are going to focus on the, the biology of behavior. Uh, you know, what, what genes might predispose uh, people for uh, behavioral abnormalities, what parts of the brain are involved in any behavior or processing smells or, you know, whatever it is that they, they study, they do so from, uh, you know, the perspective of biology. So, you know, within an organism, how are cells, genes, tissues uh, affecting our behavior? Other psychologists are going to focus at the organismal level. So how does a person you know, perceive a certain stimuli and how does that influence uh, their behavior? And then uh, beyond that, some psychologists will look at groups of people, different cultures. Uh, how is it that uh, individuals interact with one another and how do those interactions influence their mental processes and their behaviors? So the the, the field of psychology is going to span from molecules to, uh, you know, uh, individuals, metropolitan areas, cultures. And all of these different levels are going to work together. You know, if you're going to understand a problem, you need to understand it from the molecular level all the way up to how it affects societies. Uh, the example given here is depression. You know, the, the major goal of understanding depression is to develop treatments. And of course, if we think that there's a biological cause of this, well, then we should have treatments uh, associated with that. The current treatment that we have right now uh, are the SSRIs, uh, 
Um, these are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Uh, these are these are used in many cases of of depression, uh, but they're they certainly don't work in all cases. Uh, and this is because the biology behind it just doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, there's not a lack of serotonin in depressed people, uh, so an SSRI shouldn't work in all cases, and in fact it doesn't. So we need to understand uh, the biology of depression uh, better so we can develop better uh, therapeutics, better pharmaceuticals. Of course, we need to understand depression at the individual's level. You know. Uh, so psychotherapy can help an, uh, a person identify what is it that triggers uh, the depression? Uh, what are some methods they can use to cope with this? And then, of course, at the, at the group level, it helps to understand depression so that we can identify risk factors. Uh, for example, in Western cultures, at least, uh, depression is about twice as frequent in women than men. Of course, it varies from study to study, but if you have a look here, uh, this first uh, set of bars. Uh, men are green, women are blue in this case, and the uh, y-axis is showing you the risk of depression. Uh, we're putting men at one. All right, That's just what we're comparing uh, women against. When you look at um, a, a broad range of studies, the accepted value, generally speaking, is that women in Western cultures are about twice as likely uh, to develop depression compared to men. Of course, in one study it might be greater than two, and in another it might be less than two. And of course, this isn't true in all cultures. So again, we need to study uh, psychology at a variety of levels to really understand it. Now, whenever we're talking about studying uh, in psychology, what we're talking about is actually carrying out scientific studies. And this involves uh, performing controlled experiments and collecting data. All right, this is what empiricism is. So it's definitely true that a lot of the things that we know in psychology are fairly intuitive, and this might make folks think that psychology is just common sense, but it's it's really not. Psychology is not just a collection of beliefs that make sense. Uh, it's it's a collection of tested uh, hypotheses, and, and that's a, a clear distinction there. So any psychologist is going to use the scientific method, which we'll talk about in lecture two, um, but they're going to use controlled studies to actually uh, investigate a problem. They're not just going to assume and run with their assumptions. They're going to test it. Uh, the example that we're looking at here, the, the problem that, that's being addressed is how much faith should we place an eyewitness confidence? If someone comes to you and says, that's the guy who robbed me, I know it, I'm 100% confident, common sense would tell you that they're probably right. All right, but is it always the case that we can trust eyewitness testimony? And is confidence always just a factor of how accurate the, the memory is? Can we influence confidence? Can we make someone believe uh, incorrect information? And the short answer is, it, yeah, it seems to be the case. So let's look at our, our uh, two plots on the right there. You'll see we have two panels and each have two curves in them. We'll start off on the top here. So here's the experiment. They have participants watch a video of a robbery and then they show them a lineup. The participants have to identify within that lineup the the, the criminal, if, if they can, or they say he's not here. Uh, the, the tricky part here is that the criminal is never there. So the only correct thing to do is to say that they don't see the guy. All right, and that's what we're looking at in, in panel A, the correct rejection saying, no, he's not in this panel. Now the two curves here, we have a purple curve and we have a green curve. The purple curve uh, is from the participants who didn't receive any feedback from the investigator. They made their choice, they said, he's not here, that was the end of it. In the green curve, uh, after the participants made their choice, then the experimenter gave them positive feedback and said, oh, you know, most people chose that uh, person as well, good job, you know, something along those lines, something positive. After the 
participants made their choice, they had to rate their confidence. And that's what we're looking at on the x-axis there. How confident are they that the guy isn't there? And if you look whether you got feedback or not, they're fairly confident that the guy isn't there. Uh, the average value is in the 70 to 80 percent range uh, of confidence. Pretty good. And that is good because he wasn't there. Now in panel B, this is the false identification. Here's where they said that's the guy. But remember, the guy isn't there. So they've identified the wrong person here. Now if we look at the purple curve, we see uh, their confidence rating on average is about 50%. Yeah, some folks rated higher than that, some folks rated less, but it's a coin toss. I think this is the guy, but I'm only about 50% confident in that. Now, if we look at the green curve, we'll see when they get that positive feedback, well, now they're far more confident in their incorrect identification. The only difference between these groups is that the experimenter said, oh, yeah, most people pick that. All right, so whenever we're taking eyewitness testimony, we need to be very careful because if we compare these curves, here's a line going down from the correct panel in A to the incorrect panel in B, you'll see that the green curve didn't move that much. But the purple curve there, if you look at its, its red line coming down, very different. So they're far less confident in their incorrect evaluation. And that's important. If we're gonna trust eyewitness testimony, we can't just assume that because they're confident, they're correct. We have to also think about, well, what did the investigator do? Did they, did they influence uh, the eyewitness confidence at all? So what we're generating here in these types of studies are facts, right? Things that you can't argue with. You can't argue with the idea that by giving positive feedback, you increase confidence in the identification. That's a fact. Now, whether or not uh, you think that we should believe eyewitness testimony uh, or not, that's a value, and these two things are different. You can't argue with facts. Here's another example. It's a fact that uh, there were more than 30,000 deaths caused by handguns in the United States in 2009. You can't argue with that. That's a fact, all right? And that's what we generate in studies. Now, hopefully these facts inform our values. You might look at that and say, well, Heck, we should outlaw handguns. Or you might look at that and say, well, you know what? Uh, handguns are dangerous. We need, uh, we need better training for handguns. Or you might look at that and say, yeah, you know what? Uh, people die. I don't care. I want my handguns, right? Those are values. So these are two different things. And the goal of empiricism is to generate facts, things that you can't argue with. And this is important because, again, Psychology isn't just common sense. There are a lot of things uh, that we might believe to be true that actually aren't. Right? We have these things called cognitive biases. These are, these are assumptions that we make so that we can go about our day and not spend uh, too much time on little decisions. But the problem with cognitive biases is that they can lead to poor judgment. They might make us believe something that's incorrect. And there are a bunch of examples of these in the reading notes. You can have a look at them. They're pretty interesting. Uh, we'll just look at two here to give you an example. So the, the first one that we're going to look at is the availability heuristic. All right. Availability. So how, how available information is to your brain makes you think that's, that's probably more common in real life. All right. Here's the example. When people are asked, uh, in the English language, are there more words that begin with the letter R or that have R as the third letter? Most people find it easier to think of words that begin with R. Because you start with R and then from there you just fill it in. Rope, regal, rectify, rectangle, right? You can fill in a bunch of these words. And so most people, about 69% of those that they interviewed, chose R is the first letter. That's the most common in the English language. But it's actually the case that it's the third letter. In fact, if you compare these two numbers, you find about three times more words in the English language that have R as the third letter than the first. It's just a little more difficult to think of. And so we tend not to think that it's more common. Right? This, is, this is one cognitive bias here. Another one that's really important uh, that we'll go through quickly is the hindsight bias. Uh, so after the fact, uh, 
people tend to believe, oh yeah, I knew it all along, once they know. So your ability to predict becomes much better once you know the outcome. Of course, right? Because you already know the answer. But this is a hindsight bias. You might think, yeah, I knew it all along, but you really didn't. So here's an example, uh, again, from the notes. Um, in this case, they're, they're looking at actual an actual court case and they, they've given the participants um, some background information. The city of Duluth is, is uh, deciding whether or not to hire a bridge operator. All right, They have a bridge. It's possible that there might be flooding uh, and this could lead to damage uh, and that a bridge operator would help prevent any um, you know boats running into the, the bridge. But you know what? It costs a lot of money to hire the bridge operator and it doesn't really flood that often. So when, when uh, participants were asked, uh, just based on the historical data, the fact that it doesn't flood very often, uh, to determine should, should the city hire an operator? Should they, should they take out that expense uh, on the off chance that there's a flood? Because it's not that likely. In the Foresight group, you can see relatively few people chose to hire the operator. Most said, yeah, it doesn't happen that often. It's kind of a waste of money. Uh, don't worry about it. It turns out that a flood did happen. Uh, there was uh, substantial damage, and once participants were told uh, that, you know what, uh, we're trying to determine whether or not the city should have hired an operator because a flood did occur, now the majority of participants are saying, oh yeah, of course, of course you should have hired an operator. And the problem with the hindsight bias is that it doesn't seem like there's anything you can do about it. Because in a third group of participants, they gave them all the historical information. They told them, in fact, it did flood. But we don't want that to influence your judgment. So even though you know it did flood, forget about that and look at the historical data. Do you still think that the city should have hired an operator? And you see these values are very close to what we saw uh, when they were told not to have any bias. So there are a bunch of different cognitive biases out there. Uh, keep in mind that you know the way that we think about the world helps us get through it, but it doesn't always lead us to the absolute correct answer. All right, and so that's why we have to be very careful whenever we study human thinking and behavior because we have a lot of biases. We can't just go off of common sense. We have to collect data, and how we do that we'll talk a little bit more about in lecture two. All right, let's move on and see if we've gotten anything out of this. So take a moment. Pause uh, the movie and see if you can answer these questions. All right, let's see what we got here. So let's compare and contrast some research and practitioner psychologists. Well, they both study and deal with uh, human behavior uh, and, and thought processes, but the big distinction here is that research psychologists, research psychologists um, study behavior in the lab Right? They're, they're generating facts that uh, practitioner psychologists can use to help treat patients. So the researchers don't treat patients, and the, the practitioners uh, tend not to generate as much data. Uh, instead, they help patients. Now, they are similar to psychiatrists. All right? Both practitioner psychologists and psychiatrists are going to use talk therapy. They're going to help patients work through problems. Uh, the difference is that the practitioner psychologists are more trained in administering the uh, cognitive tests uh, to assess uh, certain learning disorders, and psychiatrists are going to have that medical training that allows them to prescribe medicine. All right, what is empiricism? Well, that is generating empirical data. In other words, data from a controlled experiment. The reason that this, that this is important is that we can't just assume something in science. We have to actually test our ideas. We need to generate data. And those data are what we would call facts here. All right? the, the difference between a fact and a value is that you can't argue with facts. When we generate data and we say that uh, three times as many people believe that there are more letters in the English language that begin with R, uh, I'm sorry, there are more words in the English language that begin with R than have R as the third letter. That's a fact, all right? You can't argue with facts. Values are, uh, are subjective judgments 
of how life should be and how it should work. We should outlaw handguns. Uh, we should offer free education, right? Those are values. We don't generate values with, with empiricism. We only generate facts. All right, and those cognitive biases. These are assumptions that we make as we, as we think about a problem that will lead us to an incorrect or illogical answer. All right, a couple examples, that availability heuristic. If it's a whole lot easier for you to think of something, you believe then that it's more common in the real world. But that's not always the case. Uh, there's that hindsight bias. Once you know something, you believe that you knew it all along. Right? It can be very difficult for us to remember what we didn't know when we were younger. But when we were young, we were pretty stupid. It turns out uh, we've learned a lot over our lifetime, and we didn't always know this information. But we, it, we find it hard to believe that because of that hindsight bias. All right, in this second part, uh, we're going to talk about the field of psychology, kind of how it began, and some of the different uh, tracks that are out there today. The earliest psychologists, if you want to think of them that way, uh, were nothing more than philosophers. And what distinguishes a philosopher from a scientist is actually testing your ideas. Empiricism, that's what makes a psychologist or a scientist rather than a philosopher. So the first guys, Plato, Aristotle, Descartes there, they had a lot of ideas about how the mind works, but they never tested them. And so these are pure speculation. Uh, for example, Plato, uh, his big argument was that, uh, you know, we're, we're born with certain traits and, and humans are innately good, etc., etc. Aristotle believed the, the opposite of that. He argued that when we're born, we're a blank slate, that tabula rasa there, and then depending on our life, our environment, we develop to have different mindsets. And they're probably both right to some degree, but they never tested it. So really all they have are conjectures. These were not scientists. These were philosophers. They have ideas. They make some logical sense, but there's no data to back it up. No facts, only values. Uh, Rene Descartes is, is put here because of his idea of dualism. Um, this is an outdated idea. The idea that the mind and the physical body are different from one another. Uh, no, this is not true, okay? Your mind is a product of, of activity in your brain. If you destroy parts of your brain, you destroy parts of your mind. All right, so this is an old idea. And again, it wasn't tested. So, of course, he held on to it. because He didn't have the facts uh, to dispute his value. So those early philosophers, we can pretty much forget about them because they weren't psychologists. They weren't scientists. They didn't generate any facts, so we don't care. Probably the first psychologist uh, is going to be uh, Wilhelm Wundt. Uh, of course, he's he's German, so we have to use the V's there. He's in the school of structuralism. They What they wanted to identify were the structures, as they call them, of thought. All the different components that go on as we process a task. For example, if we eat an apple. Well, what are the experiences we get? If it was in the fridge, we would say cold. If it weren't, we might say it's room temp. Uh, it's crisp, I hope. No one likes a mushy apple, and hopefully it's sweet. Could be tart, who the heck knows. But the way that um, structuralists gather data, for the most part, is just asking people, tell me what's going on in your mind. We call this introspection, because the subject is inspecting from within. So intro, within, inspection, right? So they're looking within themselves and trying to describe what's going on. And this is, this is a step beyond pure philosophy. Here they actually carry out experiments and they generate data. Uh, probably the biggest contribution that we have here uh, is the idea that there's a, dis there's a difference between our ability to sense something and to perceive something consciously. And we'll get into this in lecture four. Uh, 
the way that this was tested was with reaction time. So you give someone a tone, you have them identify when they hear the tone, and then identify when they actually can tell what the tone is. And it takes a lot longer to figure out what a tone is than to simply sense the tone. All right. Structuralism, for the most part, doesn't exist uh, these days um, because introspection has a lot of problems here. Um, you know, how do you describe how you, how you solve a math problem? Well, I don't know. I put two and two together and it's four. I'm sorry. Uh, and then there's a lot of our behavior that we just are not aware of consciously. And so we can't describe it. Most of the activity in our brain uh, is going to be unconscious to us. Right? There's a limited portion of what goes on that we can consciously perceive. And so all that unconscious activity is absolutely hidden uh, from a structuralist. But that unconscious activity is very important uh, to the next field. The psychodynamic psychologist. Sigmund Freud, the kind of angry looking dude in the upper right hand there. Freud uh, put a lot of value in the unconscious mind. Now, the psychodynamics, uh, this is not really a science. Uh, this is still a lot more of philosophy here. But it's still useful philosophy uh, because what was developed from this would be psychoanalysis, the talk therapy, uh, as well as some dream analysis, which you might believe in, you might think it's horseshit, uh, who the hell knows? In all likelihood, it's absolute garbage. Uh, but again, no one can test this. Uh, this is more of a philosophy, uh, but it's, it's useful. Practitioners uh, buy a lot into Freud because a lot of what he says is useful in the clinic. And if it works to help patients, then that's phenomenal. Not a whole lot of scientific study going on in psychodynamics. This is more about talk therapy uh, and dream analysis. You see a lot more science when we move into our next fields here, so behaviorism. What these guys say is, the mind, it's too complicated. So let's just not even worry about it. Their viewpoint is that whatever goes on in the mind is too complicated to understand, and besides, you can't really measure it, so you can't study it. So here's what we'll do. We'll give some stimuli to an organism and we'll look at its behavior and we'll find that relationship because we can measure behaviors. And so behaviorism was actually a very big contribution uh, to the to science of psychology uh, because every behaviorist is a scientist. They're all carrying out very controlled studies uh, and giving reliable readouts that you can actually measure. Right, so they want to take out the subjectivity. It's all about being objective. We give a stimuli of this intensity, we see this behavior. Here's a great example of behaviorism here. We'll talk more about classical conditioning later, uh, but classical conditioning uh, is made famous by Pavlov's dog. Hopefully we've all heard of Pavlov's dog. In this, in classical conditioning, you take uh, what we call an unconditioned stimulus to produce an unconditioned response. It's unconditioned because we don't need any work here. If you give a dog some food, it's going to salivate. It gets ready to eat, right? It, its salivary glands secrete saliva so that it can start digesting the food better. No learning required here. The learning comes in pairing that unconditioned stimulus with a conditioned stimulus. Now we call it a conditioned stimulus because you actually have to work for it here. You actually require some conditioning. If you ring a bell, dogs don't drool. They don't associate bells with food. They associate food with food. But if you pair that bell with the food long enough, then you start to get a conditioned response. And that would be that unconditioned response coming from the conditioned stimulus. Sounds like a whole lot, right? But it's actually very simple. Let's watch this movie and see what we get out of it. Pavlov's aim was to discover what caused saliva to flow. He rerouted the saliva ducts to the outside of his dog's cheek 
so that he could collect and measure the spittle. Perhaps, he thought, the production of saliva might be the result of a fixed nervous reflex, like a knee jerk. After taking many measurements of spittle, he confirmed that the dogs drooled automatically when their tongues touched food. He called the response the salivation reflex. But his work started to run into trouble. As his dogs became familiar with the experimental routine, they started to fill their cheek tubes before Pavlov had a chance to stimulate their tongues. The dogs were learning to anticipate food. Pavlov tried a new technique. He erected screens so that the dogs couldn't see what was going on. Before passing meat through the hatch, he introduced a stimulus that was totally unrelated to feeding. A ticking metronome. At first, the dog dripped saliva into its cheek tube only when the food appeared. But after a number of trials, the dog began to connect the ticking with the arrival of meat. Soon, the sound alone made the dog drool. Eventually, the dog salivated as much to the ticking itself as it did originally to the presentation of food. He called this new response the conditioned reflex. Whatever the stimulus, his dogs could soon be conditioned to produce saliva. Pavlov believed that he had discovered how animals learned, even in the wild. All right, so hopefully that makes a little bit more sense. Uh, what happened there is learning in classical conditioning uh, this shows one of the ways in which we learn. So in this video, the dog learned that metronomes, bells, lights, those all signal food. And so I should get ready to eat. This is not the only way that we learn. There are many, many ways that we learn. We'll talk more about this uh, in subsequent lectures. Another uh, classical uh, viewpoint in behaviorism would be operant conditioning. All right, it's still conditioning, it's still a way that we learn, but it's not uh, as passive as classical conditioning. In operant conditioning, the idea is that our behaviors are shaped based on whether they make us feel good or whether they bring us rewards or whether they bring us punishments. So a behavior that results in a reward is more likely to happen in the future. If you give uh, your significant other a compliment uh, and he or she is happy about that, well, you're more likely to, to give them some compliments in the future. If you say nasty things to your significant other and they, uh, you know, treat you poorly uh, or, or give you a, a kick in the ass, well, you're not likely to, to do that behavior again, right? Because it led to punishments. So the work from uh, B.F. Skinner here, that's the guy who kind of developed operant conditioning, kind of argued that a lot of our behavior, you know, might not be purely a choice of ours. It might be influenced by our environment. So if we carry out a behavior and, and it, you know, leads to rewards, then we're going to continue to do that. We might not even be thinking about this. Uh, so let's have a look at some operant conditioning here. Here's a rat. Uh, it's going to press this lever and and get some food, and it's going to learn I should press a lever. At last, he hits the bar and gets an immediate reward. 
Has he learned? Will it take him as long to press the bar the next time? Although the animal still makes quite a few irrelevant responses, he presses the bar much sooner the second time. The occurrence of a single reward has strengthened the tendency to make the response of pressing the bar. Notice that the rat performs exactly the same response which was rewarded. Okay, so here we have maximizing rewards. All right, that's one of the ideas of operant conditioning. Rats aren't born uh, knowing that they should press levers to get food. This is totally a learned behavior. Now let's look at the other side of this, minimizing punishments. With this device, we can put a mild electric shock on the grid on which the rat stands. The shock is adjusted to be annoying, but not painful. Shock is on. Shock is off. Pressing the stirrup bar turns off the shock. Although the shock is not strong, you will see that it supplies enough drive to produce a radical change in the behavior of the satiated rat. He hits the bar, the shock goes off, and he's rewarded. He hits the bar and is rewarded again. After a few more trials, which are not shown in the picture, he has learned to press the bar quickly as soon as the shock goes on. And we can see here, yet another rat learning press a lever. In this case, it's not to get food, but to turn off the mild electrical shock on the floor below. These are the two sides of operant conditioning. All of our behaviors, well, some of our behaviors at least, are going to be uh, based on maximizing rewards and minimizing punishments. Right? If you think about this, if you do something and your parents spank you, the idea is that you won't do that in the future because you got punished. And if you do something and they say, oh, I'm so proud of you, good work, you're likely to do that behavior in the future. It's operant conditioning. It works in rats. It works in people. And this came from the behaviorists. Again, they view the mind as a black box. Screw it. We don't need to understand the mind in order to observe this phenomenon. Who knows what's going on in the rat's brain? And it doesn't matter. We give it a stimulus, a shock in this case, and we get a response. All right, so that's the behaviorist approach. Let's just study behaviors because that's all you can really see. Well... It used to be all you could really see. Uh, technology has allowed us to actually look at brain activity in uh, living, awake, behaving people, animals. And that's opened up the field of cognitive psychology. So the cognitive psychologist takes those processes uh, that, that weren't studied by behaviorists and actually looks at them. So they don't treat the mind as a black box. They say, yeah, that's where the magic is. That's what we need to study. The only way that they can do this, though, is with the uh, innovations uh, of neuroimaging that have come about. Remember that EEG cap we saw uh, in the first part? Well, that's one of the techniques used by cognitive psychologists to measure brain activity while some mental process or behavior is occurring. You know, while we process sounds or while we make uh, judgment calls, we can record brain activity. We can do this uh, also using MRI, well, functional MRI. So in this technique, a uh, patient lays down in that big old machine you see in the upper uh, right-hand corner. Their, their head goes in uh, to the little uh, cradle there, and they get slid into this giant magnet. And that magnet can measure uh, brain activity. While the people are thinking or, or moving, <clears throat> so if we look on the bottom right, we can see functional MRI data 
from when people think about moving uh, their right hand versus when they actually move their right hand. So for whatever reason, they've put the left side of the brain on the right. I don't understand it, but then again, I'm not a cognitive psychologist. But those little colors you see, that, that red and yellow uh, coloration, that's showing you brain activity. And you see on the left, when the person is actually moving their right hand, the left side of their brain, which is on the right, lights up. Yeah, they get some activity on the right as well, but the left side has the most activity. And you see similar activity when they just think about moving their right hand. This is showing you activity in the motor cortex, so the part of the brain that begins uh, movements. And so you see whether you're thinking about moving or actually moving, it still requires brain activity. It's a little bit different, uh, but there are some similarities there. Of course, you couldn't do this if you don't have an fMRI. No one's going to let you cut their brain open and measure uh, activity. Uh, that, that just doesn't work out. So cognitive psychology is really boomed uh, with EEG and, and MRI. So I just want to highlight the difference between uh, how a behaviorist might approach a problem and how a cognitive psychologist might approach a problem. So let's say that there's a, a boy and a girl on a date and, and the, the boy says, you're so beautiful. All right. So a behaviorist would explain this by saying that uh, the boy is going to give this, this, this reinforcing or this, this rewarding stimulus all right, so that he can get some sort of a desired uh, positive response whatever that may be. Now, a cognitive psychologist, they're not going to view stimuli and, and response here. What they're going to concern themselves with are the questions of what's going on in their head. So does the boy really believe this? Uh, you know, so if a girl hears a compliment or an insult, how does that differ in, in her brain activity? So totally different viewpoints. The cognitive psychologist is going to focus on cognition, thinking, what's going on in that brain. The behaviorist really just looks at the behavior. Um, we also have, uh, if we move up a level, right, there, there we're, we're studying just individual organisms uh, or individual brain regions. We also have, remember, where we study groups of people. So those social, cultural psychologists are going to look at societies and, and different cultures and see, well, how are they, how are they similar? How are they different? Right? And so, so they'll, they'll, they've led us to, to understand uh, these things called social norms. And social norms are just, in any society, what's the normal behavior uh, that we're going to perceive as appropriate? All right, it's not appropriate to run down the street naked uh, and attack people. That's abnormal. All right, another concept that they've, they've come up with uh, based on the idea of social norms is that Having similar social norms uh, are going to lead to attraction. Right? We tend to be attracted to, to other people who are similar to us, you know, who we get along with because we have similar attitudes. Uh, neither of us believe that we should run down the street naked and attack people. Uh, we have similar interests. And so by understanding how societies work, we can try to explain attraction between people uh, and why people's behavior might change. So there's an idea of conformity. Right? People who live in groups tend to change their behaviors so that they're more similar to those around them, so that they have more harmonious relationships. So psychology doesn't just study individual organisms' behavior, it also studies societies. How is it that groups of people work together? Well, the group works a whole lot better if everyone kind of conforms a little bit. Everyone Everyone changes, and so our beliefs kind of come together, and then we develop social norms. So when all the people uh, conform and develop a, a common idea, it becomes a social norm. And then based on you know your, your compatibility with people in that group, that'll serve as some basis for attraction. Of course, there are other things uh, we think about when it comes to attraction besides social norms. And then by understanding what goes on in one society, uh, you can compare that to another society. So you can look at different cultures and see, well, how do they differ from one another? Uh, for example, Western cultures here in the U.S., Canada, uh, Western Europe, we, we tend to, val to value individualism. So 
uh, ourselves, right? We, we tend to see ourselves as uh, unique and special, uh, and you know, our individuality is very important to us. This is different from East Asian cultures, where they tend to have a more uh, collectivist uh, viewpoint, where they view themselves not you know, just as an individual who stands out among the crowd, but as a member of the group who's connected to everyone and, and should you know, develop harmonious relationships and try to work together with everyone. Now, it's, it's not to say that everyone of East Asian descent is going to have this mindset. No, of course not. If they grow up in a Western culture, it doesn't matter where you're from. You know, it matters, it matters the culture. It matters the social norms. Right? And so that's the focus of a social and cultural psychologist. Let's look at groups of people and how they interact. And let's see how different groups with different social norms interact. And then, of course, there's the long game evolutionary psychology. Where did this all begin? The idea behind evolutionary psychology is that it's all about natural selection. It's all about reproduction, man. If a behavior allows you to survive and reproduce, that behavior is going to become more prevalent in that organism. This makes a lot of sense intuitively, but the problem with evolutionary psychology is it's very difficult to test. Uh, what we're talking about uh, are things that happen over the course of hundreds, thousands, uh, or millions of years. And you can't go back in the fossil record and see any behavior. So evolutionary psychology uh, is a little difficult uh, to, to test, but it does make good sense. Now, if you've never had uh, an explanation of evolution or natural selection, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you a quick movie clip here from the movie um, Idiocracy by Mike Judge. He does a pretty good job of explaining it. It really all comes down to reproduction. Let's have a look. As the 21st century began, human evolution was at a turning point. Natural selection, the process by which the strongest, the smartest, the fastest reproduced in greater numbers than the rest, a process which had once favored the noblest traits of man, now began to favor different traits. Most science fiction of the day predicted a future that was more civilized and more intelligent. But as time went on, things seemed to be heading in the opposite direction, a dumbing down. How did this happen? Evolution does not necessarily reward intelligence. With no natural predators to thin the herd, it began to simply reward those who reproduced the most and left the intelligent to become an endangered species. Having kids is such an important decision. We're just waiting for the right time. It's not something you want to rush into. Obviously. No way. Oh shit, I'm pregnant again! Shit! I got too many damn kids! Thought you was on the pill or some shit! Hell no! I must have been thinking of Brittany. Brittany? No, you can't! There's no way we could have a child now. Mm -hmm. Not with the market the way it is, no. Oh, God, no. That just wouldn't make any sense. Come on over here, bitch! He don't care about you! Yeah, well, there must be something he likes over here! You mean nothing to me, baby? Well, we finally decided to have children, and I'm not pointing fingers, but it's not going well. And this is helping. So. I'm just saying that before I have in vitro, maybe you should be willing it's to... It's always me, right? Well, not my sperm count. <laughs> yeah! I'm gonna fuck all of y'all! That's my boy! Cleavon is lucky to be alive. He attempted to jump a jet ski from a lake into a swimming pool and impaled his crotch on an iron gate. But thanks to recent advances in stem cell research and the fine work of doctors Krinsky and Altshuler, Cleavon should regain full reproductive function. Put your hands off my junk! Unfortunately, Trevor passed away from a heart attack while masturbating to produce sperm for artificial insemination. But I have some eggs frozen. So just as soon as the right guy comes along, you know. 
And so it went for generations, although few, if any, seemed to notice. But in the year 2005, in a military base just outside of Washington, D.C. All right. Um, humorous, uh, maybe a little extreme, uh, but, but pretty accurate as far as um, natural selection goes. You know, it's really all about mating. Uh, the the traits that get passed along are those that get passed along. You know, whoever's not reproducing doesn't contribute to the next generation. But again, this is difficult to test. Now, that's the idea behind evolutionary psychology. And if you get this movie clip, then you get a lot of natural selection. It really all comes down to mating. Now let's see if we got anything at all out of this. Go ahead and take a moment and pause this movie, and we'll come back and answer these in just a second. All right. Well, let's uh, let's do some comparisons. Uh, so, introspection, psychoanalysis. All right. How are these alike? How are they different? Well, introspection uh, is the way that uh, the structuralists gather their data. Uh, introspection can only tell you about what's going on in the person's head that they are aware of. Can't tell you anything about the unconscious mind. Psychoanalysis is similar because it employs talk therapy, so it involves having patients come in, tell you what's on their mind. That requires introspection, but psychoanalysis uh, doesn't forget about the unconscious uh, part of the mind, and so they, they in fact emphasize the unconscious, which you can't get to with introspection. So there's a clear distinction, that, that emphasis on unconscious uh, thoughts behaviorists and cognitive psychologists. Uh, two, two very different approaches. Behaviorists say that the mind is too complicated to study, uh, so what we should do instead is uh, study how, how uh, behaviors result from different stimuli and how those are modified uh, over time with learning. Whereas a cognitive psychologist will say, uh, you know what, the mind is actually really important uh, and we should study what goes on in the mind as we perceive stimuli or as we carry out behaviors. So the behaviors uh, view the mind as a black box and the cognitive psychologists use neuroimaging to actually view what's going on in that black box. Classical conditioning and operant conditioning, right, these are similar because they're both ways that animals learn. Uh, the behaviorists came up with these. Uh, in classical conditioning, it's very passive. You take an unconditioned stimulus and pair it with a conditioned stimulus so that over time that conditioned stimulus will give you a conditioned response. Right? Pavlov's dog. Give a dog some food, ring a bell, dog salivates. After enough pairings, simply ringing the bell causes the dog to salivate. Dogs don't salivate when you ring bells, okay? If you have a dog, go give it a shot. Not going to happen. This is not innate behavior. Operant conditioning um, isn't as passive, right? In operant conditioning, behaviors are shaped over time based on rewards or punishments. If you do something uh, and it results in physical harm to you, uh, then you're not likely to do it. Uh, if it results in and, uh, you know, compliments or, uh, you know, money coming your way, whatever a reward might be to you, you're more likely to carry out that behavior. So they're both ways of learning. Uh, classical conditioning is more passive, and operant conditioning is based off of rewards and punishments. Uh, so our Western and East Asian cultures, well, over here in the West, uh, we care very much about individualism. We are special. Each person uh, is standing out uh, in the crowd. We don't blend in, whereas East Asian cultures uh, tend to emphasize harmonious relationships with one another. You are a part of the group. All right? Contribute to the group's success, not your success. All right, moving on to evolution here. What is reproductive fitness? Well, that's just your ability to survive and reproduce. That's it, and that really matters because... If you're not reproducing, you're not passing on your genetics or your traits to the next generation. So how might this influence uh, behaviors? 
Well, have you ever thought about why it is that humans live in cities and societies and why we're not just a bunch of lone wolves out there? Well, it might have to do with the fact that if you live together in a group, well, then you have the opposite sex nearby and then you can more easily mate. And if you have a group of people, well, you can help protect each other. And so you're now surviving and reproducing. And so living in families, villages, cities, that behavior, that social behavior has improved our reproductive fitness. And as such, social behaviors have become a part of the human way of life. That's the evolutionary psychology approach anyway. All right, this third part is a practical application for psychological studies. I want to talk to you about what you can do to improve your learning. Learning is not a passive process. You don't just absorb information. You have to work with it. It takes time. All right. First of all, I want to get this out of the way here. You got to take care of yourself. All right, not just to learn, but to age well. In general, if something is good for your body, like exercise, uh, proper nutrition, sleeping enough, it's also going to be good for your brain because guess what? Your brain is still made out of cells and tissues. So is your body. All right, it's a different type of tissue uh, composition, but it's still the same basic needs. All right, what's good for the body is good for the brain here. So take care of your cells. That's going to set you up uh, for mental success if you have uh, physical well-being. Now let's say you want to learn some information. Well, one thing you can do is just rehearse it. Just go over it again and again. You know, if you're an actor and you want to learn lines, well, you gotta you gotta practice. You gotta rehearse it. All right. If you want to learn uh, your scales, you have to rehearse them. Okay, so just repetition, that can really help. Uh, and hopefully you'll get some repetition here. You'll read, you'll take notes, uh, then you'll watch these lectures, pay attention to them, maybe take some notes now. So rehearsal is very important. Right? Don't just skim the material once and say, boom, got it, done. No, you gotta take notes. You got to read the material a few times so that your so that your notes make good sense, and then you watch uh, the movies, and then of course you take more notes, and then you ask me questions, and yeah. So we're going to get some rehearsal in this class. Now, just beyond rote repetition, you can also improve your ability to to remember or recall information by by uh, making it relate to you. All right, or making it relate to other information. So, so elaborate on the material. Don't just say, "Oh, okay, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum is a, a, a an intracellular calcium store." Done. Don't need to do anything more with that information. No, try and relate it to other things. Well, how does that relate to the rough endoplasmic reticulum? Well, that doesn't store calcium. No, that makes proteins. Um, proteins are in muscles, oh, calcium's in bones, okay, so these are next to each other, one makes proteins, one stores calcium. All right, well, maybe that'll help me remember it, All right? Elaborate a little bit, and even better, relate it to your life. Believe it or not, the most important thing to you is probably you. If you have kids, yeah, you'll say, oh, yeah, you know, my kids, uh, they're really important, I love them, and of course you do, but... Uh, you know, if you're not in good shape, you can't take care of them. So really, you're the most important person to you. And of course, if you don't have kids, yeah, you're selfish. You're definitely the most important person to you. Uh, there's no question. So there's a reason for this. It's very easy for us to think of ourselves because it's our brain. We know what's going on in there for the most part. So whenever you're trying to learn new information related to you, all right? So if you learn something, like about, uh, I don't know, psychoanalysis. Does it relate to you? Have you ever had it done? Do you think it's interesting? Uh, do you think it works well? Is there anything that sounds kind of weird about it to you? So try to self-reference this, all right? Make it relate to you. So let's look at some data, of course, right? We're, we're, we're heavy on empiricism here. Let's look at data to see, does this make any sense? So what we're looking at is uh, the ability to recall or to recognize words from a list. 
uh, for younger folks, age 18 to 27, and older people, 66 to 75. And so what they did was uh, give them the list of words, and then they'd ask them questions about it. So the, the structural questions would be things like, how many letters in it? Uh, how is the word uh, uppercase? Right? Things that just relate to looking at the word and seeing how it's written. All right, and that's the first uh, light gray set of bars there. And you can see they have the least amount of word recognition. They recognize, oh, I don't know, maybe about 25% of the words in their list. The semantic um, group was asked to think about it a little bit more, right? They did some of that elaborative encoding. Is the definition positive, uh, right? So think about what the word actually means not just what it looks like. And you can see they can recognize those words a whole lot better because they've thought about it a bit more. Here, they're, they're greater than 50% of the words. Uh, and then, of course, the best group would be the self-reference group. Uh, does this word describe you? Uh, does this word relate to an event in your life, right? So relate it to yourself. Whenever you do that, well, at least the folks in this study, they had a much greater frequency of word recognition. So from these data, we can see that in this group, the self-reference uh, practice helped them recognize words more frequently. Will this help you in your life? I don't know. Give it a shot. Perhaps the best form of uh, learning enhancement would be what we call the testing effect. Now let's look at that ridiculous title that I put on here. You don't know what you don't know until you know that you don't know it. Uh, this is true. This is true. You absolutely do not know what you do not know. And if these are things that might appear on a test, it would be really helpful if you knew that you didn't know it before the test so you could know it before the test, all right? So this, in this concept, what we're doing is is having repeated testing. All right, so here we're looking at student performance in an introductory biology class. Uh, so these are most likely college freshmen. Uh, we're looking at two different years, same instructor. All right, what they did differently in the spring of 2005 was give a whole lot more in-class questions. So they asked students questions more frequently. So they were getting tested more frequently. And if you look at the grade distribution, you can see that it shifts to the right. In other words, they're getting better grades, right? The grades are on the x-axis. As you move toward the right, you're getting perfect scores. As you move toward the left, uh, you're getting imperfect scores. And the y-axis is just how many students. What you can see here, in the spring 2005, we had a whole lot better grades than in the spring of 2003. Same instructor. The key difference here, more questions coming their way. So this testing effect here, very important stuff. All right, let's have a look at another study. In fact, you can find dozens of studies that show the testing effect, okay? Having to recall what you study with questions is far more effective than just simply rereading. Uh, so that repetition, it helps, but not as much, uh, or drawing out little concept maps. So in these two panels, we got panel A where it's just Questions verbatim from the reading. Uh, do you remember this? Tell me this fact from the reading. And then panel B are inference questions where you have to actually um, uh, think about the material and come to a conclusion. All right, so it's not, it wasn't written there, but you have to remember uh, the information and then use it to solve a problem. So the red bars, those are the, 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 the students who just studied. All right, so the participants in this study who just read the passage, and that's it. You can see that they are getting all, less than 30% of the questions correct. Not very good. Uh, repeated study, that yellow bar. So these are the participants who read the material and then read it again. And then they were tested. And you can see here their scores improved. They're getting mm, maybe around 50% correct. Uh, you see a similar percentage with the uh, participants who read the material and then drew out a little map to relate different concepts to one another. That's the concept mapping. 
And then the green bar there on the right, you can see they performed the best. What they did was read the passage, and then they received a, a short quiz on it. They completed the quiz, then read the passage again, and then when they were quizzed over different questions, you can see their performance is the best. Here they're getting around 70% correct, whereas just studying once, around 30% correct. So if you want to succeed, if you want to learn material, test yourself on it. All right? Try and answer some questions. So in, in all of my reading notes, I give you review questions. See if you can answer them. Come up with your own. Quiz each other. Right? Shoot some emails back and forth or instant message one another to ask each other questions. Post it onto the Blackboard site. And this is why uh, I'm going to give you guys 24 hours to answer those questions. Now you're getting a little bit of that retrieval practice. You're getting that testing effect. So hopefully when it comes test time, you already know what you didn't know and you went ahead and learned it. So now you do know it. And let's see about that testing effect one more time. So here's a couple of questions. Um, pause the movie and we'll, we'll come back and, and try and answer these. All right, well, let's see what we can do here. Uh, so what are the habits that can help maximize your learning capabilities? Well, you can take care of your body. All right, go for a run. Cardiovascular health, health definitely uh, is helpful for mental health. So take care of yourself. Uh, Read the material, and maybe not just once, maybe read it twice and make sure you take notes. Uh, relate the material to things that you already know, so you have something to grab onto when you're trying to learn this concept, or even better, relate it to, to yourself. And then, of course, quiz yourself. Quiz each other. Have someone quiz you. Right? Take, take advantage of that testing effect. See if you can answer questions before the test, and then whatever you struggle with, well, work on those. Read that material again. Look at your notes on that. Ask me. Now, this last question here, this is totally subjective. Uh, it depends on you. Are there any bad habits that interfere with your ability to learn? Well, think about it. Are you getting enough sleep? Are you eating well? If the majority of your calories come from Little Debbie, you, you might consider changing that up a little bit. Uh, are you waiting until the last minute and trying to read everything all at once? And that's probably a bad idea. You might want to spread it out over time. Read a little bit, take some notes. Read a little bit, take some notes. Go back and review your notes. All right, that wraps it up for lecture one. I'll see you guys for lecture two, where we'll discuss the scientific method.